another lecture in HIS 4470, Oral History. This lecture is Types of Oral History Projects. In their article, Ways of Listening, Hugo Slim and others maintain that there are five types of oral history interviewing. One of these is life story interviews in which the individual speaks about their own life. Another is family tree interviews in which the narrator talks about their family members, especially their ancestors. A third type is the single issue testimony that focuses on one part of a person or a group's life or experience. And for example, the Library of Congress Veterans History Project is a good example of single issue testimony. Hugo Slim and others also maintain there are diary interviews, which are multiple recorded entries from chosen individuals about a specific issue, and these are used by social scientists for longitudinal, that is, long-term studies. Finally, there are group interviews, talking with groups of narrators in mass. But these are not projects. They are methods for collecting narrated information. When you conceptualize your oral history project, think of these three types. The individual biographical project, the family history project, and the community studies project. Think about what your oral history project should be about. If it is actually an oral history project, remember that you begin with a research question. It should be as well articulated as you can make it and organizes the project so you know what sources to include and what sources to exclude. For example, if your question concerns manual labors in your community, you don't necessarily include Wall Street bankers or London artists, but you do include workers in the local factory and maybe even their managers. Again, this is driven by your well-articulated research question. Let's look now at these types of oral history projects. And the first we'll look at is biography. Obviously, a biography is an oral history of an individual. But the best biographical oral histories have gone from recounting the person's public facade to examining that person behind the persona. At least oral history used as an information collecting tool serves to liberate that person behind that persona. Biography demands a life history approach to interviewing. Even if you try to get answers to your most pressing questions or discuss your most pressing topics first, be sure to ask about the person's early life, growing up, their work life, their lived experience, and if you're interested mostly in a single aspect of that person's life like military service, ask about their time after that set of events. Whose biography might make for a good oral history project? A prominent public individual, especially those without other biographers. A narrowly prominent individual like the leader of a family. A person who you find important or interesting, particularly for your research question. Biography also bleeds into a relatively recently established genre of historical research that we call microhistory. Microhistory stems from social history and it stems from cultural history and it's an attempt to narrate the stories of individuals as a way of seeing how society actually operates. We ask big questions as do social historians, about very small units of society, in this case, individuals. When you're dealing with biographies, there are things you should listen for, things you should think about. To conduct a truly biographical project, you probably will have to return to the narrator multiple times. You must also interview significant people in that person's life. So listen for access points, names of significant individuals in that person's life, descriptions of significant events, dates of those significant events. Listen for discrepancies from previous stories. Listen for deeper elucidations from one recounting of the set of events to another recounting of the set of events. As narrators will readdress 
uh, topics because the interview process takes them from one point to another in their thinking. They remember more. They think more deeply. But also listen for apocryphal stories. These are stories that cannot be authentic, or they're a mix of authentic experience lived by that person that's been routed through information that that person has gained after the experience itself. That is to say that even though the person there experienced some or all of the incident they're describing, their memory of it has been altered by getting other information that wasn't available at the time. They frequently will change their attitudes over the course of time because they've had a chance to rethink or they've had a chance to practice what it is they want to say in an attempt to make their life make sense and to make that particular set of circumstances make sense to them. They may have also heard what others said about the experience. You can also combine biographies into a community project, and that may be a very beneficial way to deal with a crossover between the biographical project and the community project. You may start with biographies, for example, and then realize that you can expand it into some other kind of community project. The larger community to which an individual belongs is almost always their family. So that is one way of moving from a biography into a community project, is to consider the family a community. Now, it's a very specialized community. It seems obvious when we define a family that a family history interview is with multiple family members and others to research that particular family's history and experience. Remember that a family is like an intimate community, so that family oral history projects share characteristics both with biography and with community studies. What are some of the qualities of family oral history? Well, it goes beyond genealogy. You don't want to stop with a list of the ancestors and what they did, especially in a culture that activity is expansive. For example, generally speaking, American culture does not limit itself to merely recounting the ancestors and their most notable points and qualities. It expands beyond that into an integrated contextualized history in which the family is a unit of community and also part of a greater community that influences that greater community and is influenced by it. So context matters. Go beyond mere genealogy. Another good thing about family history is that it illuminates something we rarely document in any other manner, and that is the private lives of families, the private lives of individuals within families. It's an interdisciplinary tool. Family oral history is an excellent way to study social history, cultural history, anthropology, social science, ethnography, bundled into one, and you can use different approaches and can combine methodological approaches to get at the gist of what it is that you are trying to study. Family history provides opportunities for multi-generational and multi-gender perspectives on shared experiences and issues. If you conduct a project on your own family, you will begin to discover the origins of your own habits of thought, and your own traits, your own view of the world for good or ill, and sometimes it's, it, it can be a little bizarre. A project on your own family can also produce a sense of history as an intimately lived experience. I noticed when I turned about 50 years old that history stopped being something that was happening to other people. And I looked back on my life and said, I've, I've lived through some of this stuff. This has happened to me. And I began to feel a more intimate connection with historical events because I was at them, I lived through them, I have a memory, sometimes apocryphal, of them. And those things are showing up in history books. So it no longer is happening to somebody else. It has happened to me. A family oral history can take the stories of your ancestors, your siblings, your parents, even your children, and it can give you a sense of a continuity that is, at its base, the sense of history. And to repeat a truism, 
a good reason to do family history is that the family is the basic social unit. So uh, family histories are one of the basic ways of getting at social history. What are some of the steps that we should consider in conducting family oral histories? Contact the family in a manner that inspires and establishes trust. That is first and foremost. This will probably require some preliminary discussions about how to proceed within the family. It requires sensitivity to the family's needs. It requires you to be clear about what research question you're trying to answer. Therefore, you need to make it as articulate as possible. It requires you to understand some of the background and the nature of conducting family histories in general and to know what you can about this family in particular. You should inspire the family to participate. This will require you to conduct informal preliminary interviews in preparation for the formal interview process. For more information about this, please look on Yao's chapter on family history interviews, which discusses many hints and strategies for getting the best possible family interview. So I won't repeat what she says in edition 3, chapter 10, but I highly recommend that you look that over as something of a guidebook. The next type project is, of course, the community study. We've gone from the individual biography to the small group family history, and now we're looking at the community study. Obviously, you interview multiple members of a group, an organization, people in a physical locality, or some other identifiable grouping in which members share interest. Because you as the researcher and each community member brings their own experience to the study, community studies have a much greater chance of becoming collaborations, with the research question probably changing as narrators open out lines of inquiry that you had not considered. So continue to do preliminary research and do preliminary informal interviews as needed all throughout the project. Create a strong interview guide that we'll discuss in a little bit after doing your due diligence and research. The interview guide, of course, is a list of questions you want answered from each interview. You'll not get them all answered, but having the interview guide will keep you on track across multiple narrators. As with a family, you have to get buy-in from the community, maybe even more so. So explain your project to the community. For example, you may call together components of the community to discuss participation. If you're doing a general physical community, you might want to send a letter to the editor of a newspaper or place an ad in a newspaper. A lot of older people who are going to be your main source of information still use newspapers. You can also do the same with digital communications, especially if you want to catch the eye of a younger community or digitally active old folks. If your community is close or in one institution, then consider using their in-house communication. For example, if you want to do a community history on a specific business or a church or a non-governmental organization, for example, a historical society, then consider putting ads or placing notices inside of those types of communication. Use your personal contacts, of course. And that will probably lead you to do some pestering, so be kind. Enlist community assistance from members who have agreed to narrate. And do not give help to, but work with. You're not here to help people. They will shut you down. You're here to work with them. And remember, as I always say, they're doing you a favor. Let's talk now a little bit about some specialized communities. If I've put up an array of images on this slide so that you get a little bit of an idea about the wide variety of oral history projects that are done with a wide variety of communities. Some of these are ethnic communities. Crossing ethnic lines can be a difficult situation. We're not talking even about racial lines as much as we're talking about viewing everybody's background as potentially differently uh, ethnical. This can be mastered, but gaining trust is the most important step. You have to remember 
what the community will get out of the process rather than focusing on what you will get out of the product. Once you establish trust, your outsider status, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, might actually serve you well, making you ask basic questions and serve as an honest broker of multiple opinions. Work communities, again, your outsider status is an obstacle, but can also be an asset once you have gained the trust of the community. Proceed with a work community just like it was an ethnic community to which you don't belong, unless you happen to belong to that community. Try to establish trust in your work and trust in your honesty. Former members of the work community might be your best resources for informational interviews about the work and for support in recruiting current workers. That is, those people who have retired might be the best bet for getting the background story and for getting others who are currently working involved in the project. Now, one thing about work communities, if the business is still going, you will be perceived as an agent of management. So try to work through that. And remember also that there are communities of experience or communities of interest that aren't held together by anything other than that shared experience or interest. Again, you're likely to be an outsider, and so you'll have to work through those issues of trust and those issues of outsider status and insider status. I bring all of these up so that as you're beginning to look at your project, that you think broadly, especially when you talk about communities, because so many of us think of communities as physically based rather than interest based but consider an interest-based community as a legitimate target for your project. Finally, how do you deal with an individual, a family, or the community at large, whether it's a physical reality or an interest group? How do you deal with presenting your findings? Well, first and foremost, you should make arrangements to present your findings. People want to find out what you think. They want to know what you have concluded about them. You might consider making a public presentation in which you set up one or more posters, or you could have a lecture or a group discussion. Ensure that you've already made it clear to everyone what will happen to the interviews and the other work product if they go to a museum or, or an archives. Uh, have a rep from that institution at your presentation if possible. Again, and we'll talk about this in our next lecture, uh, you have some duties to the people that are giving you these narrations. Thus, we end the lecture, and I thank you, as always, for your attention.